Hello, audience. We are back live on air. It's still Jockey and Sherwin in the Batcave. Hello. Uh, and we are now joined by Ben Roberts, who is the Group Chief of Innovation at Liquid Telecom, a Pan-African uh, company with different offices in various African countries. So, Ben, it's great to have you here. Also, thank you so much that Liquid Telecom jumped in as a supporter and partner for our developers conference. And um, yeah, please. Thank you very much. Um, yes, yeah, so um, as I mentioned, um, as was mentioned, I'm Ben Roberts. Uh, I'm, I'm Chief of Technology and Innovation at Liquid Telecom. Uh, we are a Pan-African company um, and, and we are based in about 15 countries um, on the mainland of Africa with uh, operations and telecommunications operations, uh, the largest being South Africa, Zimbabwe, Kenya. Um, I'm, I'm sitting here in Kenya today. Um, we, we do actually um, have our corporate headquarters in, in Mauritius. Um, so, so like many Pan-African companies, um, our uh, holding company and corporate headquarters is in, in Mauritius. Uh, we, we're not a telecommunications company in Mauritius, um, but we we are um, able to offer our cloud and digital services. Um, so you know, it's it's very um, exciting to be here. I'm, I'm I'm sad not to be in Mauritius. I, I would love to be on the beach. Uh, I've been locked down in Nairobi for too long. Um, but um, you know the, the uh, certainly our team in, in Mauritius that, that they they were very keen for me to come to this uh, meeting. Uh, and they, they are all very excited about the, you know, the cloud and, and innovation and the digital transformation of, of Mauritius. And, and last time I was, uh, was in the country was, I think last summer, we had a global internet conference in Mauritius. Uh, and I was, you know, really feeling a vibe for that um, in, in, in the island of Mauritius. Um, but today I'm going to talk about um, really the connectivity side of cloud and, and perhaps some opportunities it can bring. Uh, the title is Cloud the Indian Ocean. Um, so uh, I'm going to start by, you know, asking a question. Uh, the presentation today is going to, um, is I call it, I call it um, some African journeys. It's from an earlier, um, you know, presentation I've done in, on, on a few African uh, conferences. Uh, but so I'll include a bit of physics and history, um, and really we're going to take some journeys. Um, so the question for Mauritius uh, is, how do Indian Ocean islands reach the cloud? And so. Um, I did manage to find this beautiful picture this morning, which uh, gets you thinking about how to get to the cloud from, from whatever island you are on. Um, so this is, um, this is a 2020 uh, statistics, uh, the, the big map on the, the right hand side, uh, the data is from Telegeography, who do global surveys on uh, submarine cables and, and, um, and terrestrial cables and, and clouds. So the circles are, are showing what we call cloud on ramp. So, so this is how this is the places where you can directly connect connect to a hyperscale cloud, and, and they're, they're counting, uh, you know, the, those on ramps. Um, and you see, obviously, in the Indian Ocean, that there is not many. Uh, well, there are no there are no hyperscale clouds in the Indian Ocean uh, yet. Um, but um, you know, all of the islands that are there um, are, are not having any particular cloud presence. You'll also see on the continent of Africa, uh, really only two cities where uh, you can connect directly to the cloud. So that the two uh, companies that, that have launched in, in, um, in South Africa are, are Microsoft and Amazon Web Services, but, but they are um, having hyperscale cloud in Johannesburg and in Cape Town. Now, yeah. uh, other places that are um, obviously to the west of Mauritius, we have, you know, you see India there, Singapore, uh, they're having more cloud data centers, but ultimately they're further. Um, so than than the, the from Mauritius, it's it's closer to get to the 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 mainstream of Africa, the mainland of Africa. The small diagram on the, on the left is is really showing the the submarine cables that are that are re that are live and planned, uh, connecting um, connecting um, the Indian Ocean islands uh, to the mainland of Africa. Uh, one of them, which is called the safe cable, goes from Mauritius and heads on towards Penang in Malaysia. Um, and, and that does connect on into you know, these places in Singapore, but that's a bit further. And that cable is very old and doesn't have much capacity. 
um, you see that there's more cables are coming um, to the west side, as I say, the shorter distance. Uh, cable systems like Lion, which connects into East Africa, into Nairobi, um, and to Moswain de Mombasa. Um, and then there are uh, the safe cable as well, connecting to the mainland in a place called, um, uh, I suppose, near Durban, um, called Mutanzini. Uh, and then a new cable, which is, I'll come back to a bit more, Metis, which is connecting into Durban in South Africa. Um, so that is, you know, how do you, you know, the question is, how do you get to them? But I'm going to go into more detail of this. Um, we've, we've been tracking this uh, internet growth in Africa for some time. And, and um, some predictions we made in, well, this is a, an excerpt from something we presented in 2012. Uh, and this is how the African internet uh, looked in 2012. Um, so we had subsea cables that were, that were going around uh, the, all the coastline of Africa. Um, and I said that safe cable, which goes via Mauritius, has been in place now for quite a long time. Um, but every, every country in Africa, uh, and, and the Indian Ocean Islands being no exception, were just using these subsea cables to connect a straight line to um, a peering point in uh, Europe, basically. So um, either London or Paris or Amsterdam, uh, typically, English-speaking countries uh, connecting into into London, uh, and French-speaking countries speaking uh, connecting perhaps into Paris or, 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 or you know one of those large peering exchanges in in Europe. Um, so that is how the African internet was connecting, all the hubbing done in Europe, all the peering and connectivity being done in Europe, um, and and that as you can see, that's not very useful. There, there were no cloud data centers in Africa at this particular time, um, but you know, that's not particularly useful. If you're in Mauritius and you want to connect to the closest server, which is in Africa, if you have to go to London and back again, you can see that's not not the optimal way of doing it. Um, so, um, but this was a progression. This this had just moved on from the satellite. Subsea cables had come. Um, so by moving from satellite to cable in this configuration, latency had reduced, but by only fifty percent. And I'll and I'll can't explain that. Um, you know, the latency of a satellite is about five hundred milliseconds back back and forth from the satellite um, and then the latency to Europe had been reduced to about 200 250 milliseconds so not a huge reduction in latency uh, and not not close to what's possible um, so um, we also made these predictions for 2022 we're, we're, we're quite well advanced in this uh, journey now I, I, I so Mauritius on this map I'm sorry but you know we're now getting to a stage where we have a much more fully meshed African internet uh, different cities being connected to each other, hubs emerging. Um, there's no, um, you know, pan-African place where um, where it's exchanged, but we're seeing some cities and, and in Cape Town, Johannesburg, uh, Nairobi, I've mentioned, um, others in West Africa, in, um, in Lagos, um, you know, places where a lot of traffic is being exchanged, and I'll, and I'll give some more details on this. Um, you know, but we, you know, when we were asking this in 2012, 2012, we were asking this prediction. We were saying, will there be content and traffic to support this this uh, this architecture? And and uh, I think you know it has come about. So I'm going to give some background on um, this. Is the the stats as they are now? Um, so on the right hand side, um, we see the um, the price of a 10 gigabit wavelength. This is from London to Johannesburg. Um, so you can see just how dramatically. That has been falling. Uh, the red line is the median price, uh, and then there is a range of what people pay, uh, depending on how much they buy. Uh, but it's come down now, in just in the last three years, even uh, from around fifteen dollars or fifteen thousand um, dollars, fifteen dollars per megabits per second, uh, to around about two or three dollars per megabits per second. So the price of internet transit in South Africa is the lowest uh, in in sub-Saharan Africa, and, and is around you know it's, it's two dollars to two dollars fifty is the price of internet transit. Um, bearing in mind that in Europe, it's going to be less than $1, but it's the cost of getting from Mauritius to, to Europe is considerably higher than it is from getting from Mauritius to South Africa. Um, the map on the left is, is uh, um, um, showing the data links between how, how much data is flowing between countries. Um, unfortunately, Mauritius didn't, doesn't consume enough to get onto this map. Um, but uh, but I, most uh, if, if Mauritius had a line, uh, it would be going towards South Africa for the intra-African connectivity. Um, but we see that these big hubs that have emerged, uh, South Africa, Kenya, uh, Nigeria and, and, and Ghana are, are emerging 
uh, Djibouti. Uh, these are hubs of connectivity where you see a lot of lines emanating out from these places to other countries. Traffic is being exchanged in these cities. Kenya in particular is a hub for East Africa, Nairobi particularly, connecting Uganda, Rwanda, South Sudan, Ethiopia, Tanzania, all of those countries. And also some of the, the, the ISPs in, in Mauritius are using those LION cables to come in and connect into Kenya. South Africa being the biggest uh, of the internet hubs, that is connecting all of the SADC countries, uh, as well as having you know, large interconnectivity between, um, between the other hubs, between Kenya and South Africa. And also you see a, a line here between Kenya and Nigeria. This is how internet traffic is actually moving. So if you remember, South Africa is where the only cloud on ramps are for the hyperscale cloud, um, but it's also the hub of connectivity. Perhaps there's a reason why. Um, so, you know, hypothesis we have really, you know, so on the map, on the left is showing, um, on the mainland of Africa, it is showing the infrastructure, the, the roads, railways, ports, pipelines, the, the physical infrastructure uh, that exists for trade. And some of it's been there hundreds of years. Uh, some of it is being uh, developed a lot, in a lot of African investment from China uh, coming into building these new transport corridors. You see a big gap uh, the sub -Sahara, uh, the, the, between the Sahara North and Sahab Sahara South. Uh, so, you know, not much infrastructure crossing that, uh, that, that huge physical barrier. Uh, and then you see the on the right, you see you know, this, this is where the subsea cables go. Now, if you think back to the last slide that was showing where the data is actually flowing, it's clear that the data is flowing those terrestrial trade routes um, rather than necessarily flowing the, the submarine cables that have been built. Uh, I, you know, a, a reason for this is that um, where you have where you have infrastructure and, and roads and railway, you have trade, you have movement of goods, movement of people. What follows next is is movement of information, people communicating, people exchanging data, um, and you know data being the new oil that is being transported around um, across the infrastructure that we've built. So that is why that they are you know that they are big um, users you know following those paths in the intra-African connectivity. Um, the subsea cables are still used to get to Europe, uh, so the subsea cables are still carrying most traffic to Europe. But at Liquid Telecom, we've been very busy building the infrastructure on the African continent and interconnecting um, those African countries. Um, so um, I'm just going to give a little introduction to some laws of physics that, to anybody that doesn't know them here. Um, some of my favorite physicists uh, on the left, there is uh, Isaac Newton, who, who um, invented most of the laws of physics I'm going to explain. Um, there is Albert Einstein there who, who uh, did go on to say that those don't quite apply if you are traveling at the speed of light or if you are near a black hole. Um, but on the left, uh, bottom left is um, engineer Scott from Star Trek. And he was the first engineer to say that uh, you can't change the laws of physics. Uh, and he said that in the 23rd century. So it's very clear the speed of light in a medium is, um, is uh, the speed of light in a vacuum uh, divided by the refractive index. Uh, and velocity is distance over time. These have been there. These laws have been there since 500 years, since the time of Newton. Um, so, what that basically means is that um, the latency, the round trip delay that we have in an internet network, is around about 1,000 times um, the distance, twice because it's a return trip, um, divided by uh, two times 10 to the eighth, which, as I say, is the speed of light in a vacuum. In, in, sorry, speed of light in a glass, in, in a doped silicon fiber optic cable. Um, if you are using satellite communications, it is faster, but the distance is much longer. So those geostationary satellites are much further away, um, and, and the, the radio waves travel at the speed of light. Uh, but with the fiber optic cables, uh, the reason the latencies come down is because the, the distance is so much less. So I'm going to go into explaining this. Uh, um, and um, so this is, um, you know, if you're making a journey from Cape Town to Cairo, um, and you, you go to Google Maps, it will tell you that it's about 8,000, 10,000 kilometers, and it will tell you there's, there's a road route there you can drive, or you can take a western route, it's a bit further. Um, on the right, I'm showing the internet packets, how, uh, how they generally are flowing. Um, so uh, starting in Cape Town, um, traveling all the way up to London, um, and then trekking through Europe towards uh, the southern Italy, Palermo and southern Italy, uh, the Cairo. That then... Um, that then returns the latency um, that we experience when we actually ping on a network is around 209 milliseconds because it's taking a longer distance than is necessary. If we use the laws of physics, as I mentioned, and, and we know that it's 10,000 kilometers, if we use that equation I just presented, 
uh, we would it should be 97 milliseconds between Cape Town and Cairo. Uh, but the way the internet packets are exchanging, it's 209. Um, I'm going to do one that's crossing Africa. I have a lot of more examples of this. I'll do one that's crossing Africa here. Um, so if you're driving from Mombasa to Kinshasa, um, that uh, it might take you two days. It's, it's, very, it's a very bad road. Uh, but you can see it's only 4,000 kilometers. That means that the internet latency should be 38 milliseconds. Unfortunately, uh, the way the packets flow is not so. They travel from Mombasa, they travel to Southern Europe, uh, into Marseille, into, into London, uh, and then they flow around on subsea cables to get to, uh, to, get to Kinshasa on the, on the West Coast subsea cables. Um, and overall, they go back the same path as well. We see it's 296 milliseconds. So instead of obeying the laws of physics, we've taken a much longer path than we should have done. And we've taken, the, um, you know, almost six times as much. Uh, this is my favorite. I, I haven't, uh, I didn't do an example for Mauritius, but I, but I did do an example for Madagascar, which is an Indian Ocean island, fits in with what we're talking about today. If you go to Google and find out how to get to Maputo, from Maputo to Madagascar, uh, even though it doesn't look very far, you see there's no direct flights, there's no passenger boats. Uh, so it can't give you a distance. It's, it's only a few, a few hundred kilometers. But um, if you go and look in Lonely Planet Guide, it tells you that the only way to get from Maputo uh, to Madagascar is to go to the harbor and try and find a freight boat that you can, you can hitchhike a lift on. Uh, so you can see it's not easy to travel there right? if you're traveling by, you know, by land. But it, as I say, it's about 800 kilometers. It's not very far. Uh, the packets start in Maputo. Uh, they go south towards uh, South Africa on the subsea cable. Uh, they then cross South Africa to Cape Town to get onto a West Coast subsea cable. They go up to London. Uh, they then go into Paris um, and then they go to Madagascar. As I mentioned, French speaking companies of uh, countries often interconnecting in Paris, English speaking African countries uh, interconnecting in London. Uh, so that um, that whole journey is going um, around the whole path of the uh, of the coast of Africa twice, uh, which actually makes it even longer than using a satellite. If you use a satellite, go to space and back, it would be 550. Uh, but as you go around the, uh, the, 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 the continent of Africa, which is really big, it's actually more than the distance of going around the Earth. You see it's almost 600 milliseconds in latency. I'm here to change all that. Uh, we, we have put together um, a One African Broadband Network. This is on the mainland of Africa, but it, it is uh, no exception. Uh, and we have customers connecting into Mauritius, Seychelles, La Réunion and, uh, and Madagascar, having, um, you know, using their subsea cables to connect those Indian Ocean customers into the main peering points on the east and southern coast of Africa. So using our One Africa broadband network, I'm tracing here from Cape Town to Khartoum in South Sudan. Um, now this, uh, suddenly uh, we've reduced the latency, we've, we're lowering the uh, the cost as well, but we're lowering the, the time um, it takes data packets to travel. It's only 120 milliseconds. So it's getting very much closer to that um, you know, number that I was talking about that is determined by the laws of physics um, and, and you know, making it possible for you to use cloud that is hosted in one of these countries. So every African country is not going to have their own hyperscale cloud um, data centers. You, know, you saw earlier how... Um, only South Africa has got it. They will come to other places, but there are 54 countries in Africa, and then there are you know six or seven countries in the Indian Ocean. They're not all going to get a Microsoft or an Amazon Web Services data center uh, in any time in the near future. But you know, using the networks, we can connect very low latencies to those that are there. And, and South Africa is the place right now. They'll be coming to East Africa too. Um, so that is the the question we were asking earlier. Would you know? Would the content come to Africa. So um, Microsoft were the, were, the, were the first and Amazon Web Services were the second to come in with their hyperscale cloud data centers. Um, so they're in, in Johannesburg, Cape Town. But all of the other big names in global internet. Um, so, you know, I've got a few logos here, Facebook, Amazon, uh, Microsoft, Netflix, Apple, Akamai. All of these people have come now to Africa with some kind of presence. And then not just from, from, from America as well, to, to South Africa from the other side, you know, big content global providers from China. Um, so they are all having hosting and peering and network caching points in data centers in South Africa. So, you know, that makes it a very good place to get your internet 
you can you, you can connect to cloud data centers in Europe if you want, but it will be much slower and will be less good experience to your application development. So in 2020, where is Mauritius? Um, so I, I did a trace from my house here um, and I, I'm in, in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, it didn't quite go. You know, as I said, things don't always follow the infrastructure that is in place. So there is a cable that goes from Mombasa um, to um, to Mauritius, which is called the Lion cable, the Lion system. But the packets didn't follow this. So I traced to uh, Telecom Mauritius. I can see that my packet goes from Nairobi, goes to Johannesburg. And then uh, Mauritius Telecom are at the Johannesburg Internet Exchange. Uh, so they're peering there. Um, and, you know, the packets are exchanged, not in Durban where the subsea cables land, but further inland in Johannesburg. And that is where the, the packets are landing. So we can see that, um, you know, Mauritius has got the connectivity. It's on these cables that go to East, East Africa, Southern Africa and East Asia. But the traffic largely, um, intra-African is being exchanged via the South African number one that is carrying most of the traffic. Um, so it's not just Telecom Mauritius, a whole bunch of, you know, of those uh, Mauritian telcos and ISPs or have got presence in, um, in South Africa and, and a number are emerging and having those in Mombasa and Nairobi as well. Um, so that is the flow of traffic. Um, what is really going to happen to make a massive difference to the Indian Ocean is this METIS cable, uh, which is um, it's a consortium of many of the Indian Ocean operators. And that's landing, um, I think it's you know, pretty much landed, but it's coming ready for service any day now. Uh, but Liquid Telecom are the landing party. So Liquid Telecom South Africa have landed that cable in uh, South Africa for, um, for the, the consortium members of the METIS cable. Uh, and then we will connect, it lands in Durban, um, and which is the third biggest city in South Africa, but we will provide connectivity uh, from Durban to the data centers in Durban, uh, but also to the big data centers in um, Cape Town and Johannesburg. But we might see Durban emerging as you know, a point of interconnectivity and hubbing for Indian Ocean Islands because of that massive cable. It's having very much more capacity than the existing SAFE and LION system. So it's been built as an investment for the future. All the Indian Ocean operators seeing that they need to get to Johannesburg and, and to get to those cloud data centers, that being the opportunity. Um, Mauritius, I read the other week, has got one of the highest uh, penetrations of fiber to the home I, I, in Africa and perhaps, you know, even even globally is up there. Uh, so, you know, fantastic that um, in a small island, you're able to have, you know, a very good level of, um, of fiber to the home, fiber to the building, enabling people in Mauritius to, to use the services, um, use the cloud that is there. And, and, you know, we've got the infrastructure to get there. Um, opportunities are, are massive for developers. Um, you know, Mauritius is a major banking center and it's a major center for uh, holding companies of, of global corporations and, and, their, and, the, and the African divisions of global corporations and pan-African companies. Um, and, and Liquid is, um, is one of them. Um, there are uh, three other or two other you know, Pan-African backbone telecommunications companies, and, and um, they're also headquartered in Mauritius. And, and I, I've been on the board of one of them for many years. I come to Mauritius for board meetings. You know, it, it, is, um, it is a place where all of these Pan-African networks are, are being based from their corporate locations. Um, huge opportunity then from the banking center side for developers in Mauritius to look at, you know, applications uh, in fintech, blockchain, uh, I know that Mauritius was aspiring to become, a, you know, a blockchain center of excellence some years ago. You know, massive opportunity for for developing these things, um, and the tools are there. The, the cloud is there, um, and I, I, I'm a very, I've got a passion for Internet of Things as well. Uh, so, you know, I see that as being a great opportunity for doing smart, uh, smart agriculture, smart everything really. Um, and in Mauritius, there is a dedicated uh, Internet of Things network. Um, and th that is also onto the African continent. I'm just going to throw that in there because I do like IoT so much. But, you know, in Kenya, we have a, an Internet of Things network. We're looking at these African centric uh, IoT applications in health, and agriculture, uh, utilities, metering, smart metering, electricity, water, sewage uh, and smart cities as well. Um, these are having, um, you know, a very big difference to the way that some of the smart city applications are happening in Europe. But ability to transform cities and, and lives, you know, and, and the way that um, the way that we, we, we get our utilities. Agriculture is a massive thing. And we're doing a lot of IoT in agriculture in Kenya, looking at arable farms and also tracking cattle and others, um, transforming agriculture and transportation and logistics as well. Tracking of devices is, is a massive application. 
um and and you know that is uh, um you know very much um developing very fast uh, iot is using devices but it's all using cloud computing for processing the data that's being collected from those devices so um the, the technology we've used in in iot is a is a technology called sigfox um so we build a whole countrywide network uh in liquid telecom in particular we've built the the countrywide network in kenya um there's someone in south africa as well who's built a countrywide network you can see the coverage of this here uh, but uh, there is a local partner as well who've covered Mauritius with a uh, full IoT network. This is they're called uh, Mascarenes Connect Limited, uh, covering both uh, Mauritius and Le Réunion. So uh, a good opportunity to um, to uh, do IoT applications and also to collaborate with companies from South Africa and Kenya who are developing these application use cases. If we have successful agriculture, you know, if we have successful IoT systems for uh, growing uh, coconuts that we've developed in South Africa, we can still use the same technology for growing coconuts and, and, and transforming agriculture in Mauritius. So um, just wanted to talk about that particularly. Um, Liquid Telecom's approach with the backbone that we have, this is our fiber optic backbone that, that is covering, but we are also um, extending some of the biggest data centers on the continent. Um, our, our brand for this is called Africa Data Centers, but we have um, some of the biggest data centers in Cape Town, Johannesburg, uh, the biggest in, in Nairobi and the biggest in East Africa. Um, expansion, smaller data centers in Kigali, Harare, uh, and we're expanding now in, in Mombasa, which is where the Lion uh, cable from Mauritius is landing. Um, huge uh, data center potential, uh, and that is physical data center infrastructure. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about cloud deployment and types of cloud, cloud deployment. Um, so private cloud is one. So that is um, where you have your own uh, private cloud, you have your own uh, your own cloud server based in a data center or maybe on your own premises. You have, you know, that is your own server and nobody else can touch that, uh, that particular piece of hardware. So you can still use cloud computing uh, principles, uh, virtual machines, but it's on your own dedicated hardware. Um, public cloud, that is, um, that is what is being hosted in, on the African mainland. Uh, people like Microsoft, AWS, um, having those massive data centers. Um, and they have huge compute powers, massive scalability and elasticity um, enables you to scale up your applications really fast. You can just get going and developing with a credit card um, without buying or installing any servers. You can start developing your applications, just log in tomorrow and, and, and get developing. Um, and then somewhere in the middle is what we call hybrid cloud. Uh, and that is where you, you have a, a combination of both. So if you're a bank, for instance, you have in your bank uh, head office, you have your own server running your containers, your, your, your virtual machines for running your banking applications. But you might then use some powerful systems that in the public cloud, you might not have enough compute in your, in your banking center. So you might use artificial intelligence, machine learning, use the power of that public cloud. And this hybrid cloud comes together um, one of my colleagues, Winston Ritson, will be talking uh, more later in the week just about the connectivity uh, between private cloud, hybrid cloud, public cloud, and, and just how you get more into the networking side of that. But the, the evolution is, um, particularly for an island, I, I think is going to be, private cloud is going to be a big thing. Yeah? So um, you might want to keep your, your data because of um, maybe you know, a risk, what happens if a submarine cable gets cut or something. You probably, if you're a big company in Mauritius, you want to keep your data on the island, but you also want to um, have the benefits of using the public cloud. So this hybrid is a very um, important option for, um, for Mauritian companies and Mauritian innovators to use. Um, Microsoft Azure, um, we're at Liquid Telecom, a Microsoft partner, uh, but Azure is, is using a, a full spectrum of different cloud-based um, you know, services, infrastructure as a service, that means you can have those virtual machines, those virtual servers, um, and, and that, that is, is, is pretty much going to look exactly the same, whether you're using private cloud or whether you're using the public cloud. When you spin up a virtual server, it's going to look kind of the same, um, but you know, it's using that, that different infrastructure below. Uh, platform as a service, that is when you're starting to having development platforms and, and, and actually using the cloud to uh, embed and develop your applications and software as a service. Um, that is where you just run the software application from, from the cloud. So um, we're using Skype here today, but uh, you know, with Microsoft Teams and, and Microsoft Office, these are all software as a service applications. So um, 
when we are looking at the the private cloud option, you know, mostly that private cloud is having the, the IaaS uh, capabilities, uh, and the public cloud is really expanding much more capability into the PaaS and SaaS. So that's why you want to kind of use the hybrid cloud model when you want to keep your data close to you, but you want to have that power of those other applications to enable you to develop fast, get applications um, that scale very fast as well. Um, Azure Stack is, um, is our private cloud option. Um, so it is powered and looks exactly the same as Microsoft Azure. It is a private cloud um, um, solution. It can be hosted um, in a data center or on your premises. Uh, Liquid have managed services around that. We will help you run that. And, and Winston will talk more later in the week about the networking. We'll help it connect to the public clouds for you, for your, um, for your networking. And we have professional services to help you um, you know, help you get get things up up and running, and how to keep your um, you know keep your your services maintained. Now, um, this uh, is is basically giving a very powerful um, you know, set of solutions. Uh, we we have. I'm going to go on to um, showing um, the the map. Microsoft Azure. They're, they're our partners um, in, in sending cloud. This is their uh, 50 Azure regions where they keep the public cloud. Uh, but Liquid Telecom have added in this Azure stack. So we have this um, four other Azure, re uh, Azure stack regions uh, where you can use all of the applications and a lot of the infrastructure service, some of the software and platform as a service features uh, on the local platform. We have not yet put one in Mauritius, uh, and, and it is something that we are, we are planning and, and we are following demand. And I think for us, we are you know, we're very keen to talk to uh, companies in Mauritius that are interested in this. But we can... Um, you know, if you are a bank or something like that, you need to have this hybrid cloud option. We certainly can install one of the Azure Stack devices in your banking premises or in a data center in Mauritius as well. We have very strong partnerships with data centers in Mauritius. You can come and install that Azure Stack device, help you with the connectivity to get to the public cloud, and make your hybrid cloud solution for you. That is where Liquid Telecom has its uh, capability. So anyway, um, I've, I've done the journeys. Uh, this is where we start, uh, and, and this may not be a tropical island, but you know, as we as we leave the ferry uh, to get towards the, uh, the the ocean to connect across, uh, this is where the journey begins. So I'm looking forward to some some questions today. Thank you very much. Ben, this was a very interesting and informative session. It was really impressive. Um, some of the aspects that you uh, that you um, explained in a very mathematical way because of the physics um, or the laws of physics, I'm totally with you because latency and uh, the routes are absolutely a, a, a pain factor uh, here on the island. And um, I was just uh, early on, Sherwin and I, we were a little, had a little chit chat in regards to different cloud infrastructures. Uh, I was really happy that you showed the map of Azure with the, with the data centers now in South Africa North, as well as the now having this option that you guys, Liquid Telecom, is offering additional stack regions, which is great. And uh, yeah, the outlook of having um, cross connections um, or connections across the African continent I mean this is this is really really uh, fantastic to to see and um, it, sh it should come sooner than later uh, because yeah with the situation about the sea cables going completely around the continent uh, having their uh, central um, exchange point either in London or in Lisbon or in Frankfurt um, it we already had this situation that the island was kind of cut off from international traffic mm -hmm. and only then when they started to reroute traffic through the different cables like safe and line line two that we had then like the escape routes uh, via uh, southeast asia it was kind of getting uh, you know, covering the the pain period a little bit, and uh, so yeah, having this outlook of of more information coming up, um, I think this is very good. Um, um, on, on your side of of um, development, um, any timeline maybe about when there could be hybrid cloud capabilities on the island? That's a good question, uh, and um, you know, I, I did. Uh, so last time I came, I came last summer, uh, and I did sit with the 
um, the minister of um, ICT. Um, I had a session with him, and um, you, you know, I, I think that um, Mauritius does have an opportunity. You know, with the the Metis cable coming online, um, it has an opportunity. It's a safe location. The reason we have our corporate headquarters in there is because of Mauritius's, you know, you know, good governance, um, and also, you know, it has a very um, uh, attractive uh, taxation regime for for international companies. And if, if you look at Europe, um, you know, I, I've talked about London and Frankfurt and, uh, and Amsterdam. They, they have been the connectivity hubs for a very long time now where, where internet traffic has been exchanged mostly. Um, but there's a small country on the west side called Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, which is an island uh, like Mauritius. Uh, it's a bit bigger than Mauritius, I think, but uh, it's still an island. Um, and um, the northern part is, is part of the UK, but uh, the southern part is an independent country. And, and that country in Europe had um, uh, a particularly good you know, tax um, uh, perspective and from having one of the lowest VAT, value-added tax um, in, in the perspectives in Europe. So Ireland has seen massive, massive infrastructure development in data centers. So all of the global players um, from, that have come from North America have made huge investments in data centers in Ireland, um, despite the fact it wasn't the most obvious place to connect, it wasn't in the hub, it wasn't in the center, uh, it mm. was just a place from a tax perspective. Um, so, uh, you know, Mauritius's opportunity to attract global uh, cloud providers is, is gonna be around that good governance and taxation. It does have an opportunity. With the infrastructure that's now in place and Metis being there, um, you know, I, I think there've been, uh, you know, talk of more projects towards Southeast Asia as well. Um, it's going to be a while, uh, but but you know it, it needs to start uh, marketing itself um, towards, towards, um, towards towards that, that opportunity. opportunity. And, and, and when, I was, when I mentioned I met the minister, that was a global internet or pan African internet conference that was, was taking, taking place. place. It, it moves, moves around, around from country to country. country. Last, Last year it was, it was in Mauritius, Mauritius hosted, hosted by our partners, Rogers Capital. Uh, we were there mm -hmm. with Platinum. So, but all of the big guys were there. So you know the Microsoft and the Google and the Facebook, they were all there and present. Uh, and I, and I yep. do think that you know it's something that Mauritius needs to talk about, and it needs government leadership to to, to push it. But I think there's definitely an opportunity. Uh, I, I know that um, Cap Verd uh, is setting itself up to be um, some kind of a hub as well, um, and that's on an island on the west coast of Africa. There's a lot of subsea cables converging in Cap Verd, uh, and that is setting you know positioning itself potentially as an interconnection hub. And I was talking to I forget which country it was. Uh, and it wasn't Papua New Guinea, but some some island uh, in, uh, in in Indonesia uh, was having mm -hmm. a lot of cables and was pushing to build more cables uh, and positioning yep. itself being another Indian Ocean hub. So it's, it's definitely the chances are there. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, one aspect that I would like to cover in regards to the situation with the hybrid cloud um, how does this um, effect or how does this uh, come into play in regards to, um, let's say, uh, data privacy and um, government restrictions in order where uh, data is allowed to be stored? Because I know, for example, that in Europe you have a government cloud, like in, in Germany, in France, and um, I mean, a lot of companies here in Mauritius, they, they have no other chance right now than to either keep their data on, on premise or have it offloaded uh, in, in, a, in, a different, in a different country. So what, what's your point of view on, on this kind of ex, um, aspects when it comes into um, data privacy, government um, related information, maybe even biometric information? Mm. Uh, a good question. I'm, I'm very glad you asked it. Um, so, you know, um, Kenya um, recently passed a um, pretty solid, um, you know, data protection laws. South Africa, I think, has passed. I think it's in force now, but they have the Poppy Act in South Africa. Um, Europe is, is well known for having this GDPR and European countries having this general data protection regulations. Um, all of these regulations start from the premise that data belongs to uh, data belongs to the you know, the citizen basically. If, it, if it's data about you, it belongs to you. So if you if you open an account uh, with uh, Mauritius Commercial Bank and you tell them your name and address and your and your and your mother's maiden name and all these things, 
that's your data that you're giving to them. Um, and, and they then become custodians of that data. And it's their position to, to look after that nicely for you. Um, the reality is that um, it, it, it shouldn't um, make a difference. Um, uh, it, isn't, it isn't entirely necessary that the data, from a protection point of view, but it has to remain and stay in Mauritius. And, and what countries who've adopted this GDPR-like um, like, um, legislation is they say that um, you can move data, if you have data about, you know, but the data belongs to you. Uh, if you give it to the, to the bank, you know, they can keep it. But if they want to move it to another country, that's fine. They can use a cloud in another country. It's fine as long as that country has decent data protection laws in place that are as good as ours. Um, if, you, um, if you were to host that data in a country that says um, that, that has no law or has a law that says the government can come and take the data any time they like, that wouldn't be a safe place for your data. Um, so as I mentioned, those two countries where the, you know, the subsea cables are um, have got good data protection laws in place. It's, it's important for Mauritius. Uh, privacy is important as well you know, to... to have its own data protection laws. But it's not necessary to say all data must stay in the country. Countries that are doing this are making themselves a bit insular and they won't be, um, they won't be attractive destinations for, for uh, cloud investment. So if you have you know, good governance laws that say, yeah, we'll look after your data, blah, 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 but you can move it to, to those countries that have got good data protection laws as well. That, that's for me is, is, the, is, the, is the way forward. And um, hybrid cloud is perfect for this anyway. I mean, hybrid cloud is the perfect solution for Mauritius anyway because of the some of the distances um involved and and you know risks around you know what happens if a, if a cable gets cut um but um you know that would be the way to go forward with uh, with data protection legislation so do you see this as a barrier to the cloud like are customers worried towards these laws or it's something that we don't see much these days yeah i mean people are um people hear a lot of um uh funny things i, I think uh, uh, about about data and, and you know there's a lot there's a lot of chat going on now even you know we're hearing about apps from one country being used in another country and, and data they're collecting so people are starting to be more aware of it and um you, you know ultimately when you give your data to somebody you've got to know that um that company you're you're using it is, is going to be trustworthy uh, and that's where we need governments to to protect us we need governments to say this is the law uh, if I give my if I give my information to the bank to open an account, the law says that they can't just sell that to Coca Cola to come and sell me bottles of Coke. Uh, um, you know, I've given it to the bank for the purpose of opening a bank account. That, that, that it belongs to me, and it's not theirs to sell. So I think people are becoming more aware uh, of that, mm. um, yep. and uh, um, you know it, that, that's got to start from from where it is. You know, it, it's um, there is a naivety on, on the African continent, I think, around you know what this means. But people are becoming more aware, more aware fast. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Uh, I mean, even the situation with all the uh, increased um, restrictions and, and also when you go onto the internet, you get greeted by a lot of cookie banners, uh, consent banners and bits and pieces, which is also, to my opinion, adding uh, to create the awareness among um, the consumer. And uh, yeah, with, with the Data Protection Act here in Mauritius, I think we are on a good way uh, to be, to provide this kind of um, uh, regulatory framework uh, mm -hmm. in this regard. So I'm really happy about that and pleased because as far as I understood, it is, has been um, developed with uh, the American HIPAA, uh, as well as with the European GDPR uh, regulations uh, in mind. So it is actually quite quite advanced and, and um, consumer friendly in regards about what is allowed and not allowed, the different roles in regards to this aspect. Um, let's just come back to the um, uh, aspects of um, resilience and uh, redundancy of, of network connectivities. Um, you showed on the maps that um, Liquid Telecom is really a um, strong player on that part. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, where do, you, where do you see the forecast that um, we might have chances to, let's say, um, have um, a more reliable latency from Mauritius towards um, 
countries all over Africa because um, I made a test of usually um, latency response times from, from Mauritius to, to the Azure data centers all over the world is about 280 to 350 milliseconds. I mean, even with your uh, calculation of 209, this is best case scenario because there are still the switches and delays in between. Whereas if we if we go host in, in uh, South Africa North, it's it quickly drops down to around 70 milliseconds, which is fantastic to have uh, four times, five times better performance. But it's also the situation that right now, in regards to Microsoft, um, there's a higher price to pay because the data center has just been established. So question for you, where do you see the possibility that um, other countries, even inside Africa, can be reached um, faster? And perhaps if there are maybe predictions in regards to getting an uh, equalizer in regards to the cost? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And, and I will I will go into explain how we how we deal with it as Liquid Telecom. So, so, so this is the map on the left. Um, you mm -hmm. know, that's the map network. The little dots you see on the map, um, not all of them, but the, the bigger ones that, that are there, they're the main cities. Now, there are peering points in, in every city, um, in, in, um, in, in you know, every capital city in Africa, um, where we operate now, it's got some kind of internet exchange. There are peering points there. South Africa has got, you know, large um, peering exchanges in, um, in, in, in three cities. And there, there, there was two you know, there's more than one, uh, you know, um, uh, option for peering exchanges in, um, in in South Africa, in Durban and Cape Town and Johannesburg. I'll mention, uh, you know, uh, Internet Exchanges South Africa, uh, Inc. ZA. I'm on the, the management committee of, um, on, on the board of, uh, of that. So I'm, I'm, you know, involved in the governance and running of those Internet Exchanges in South Africa. Um, so they're in three cities. And, and we at Liquid Telecom, we, we don't just connect into to Joburg. We connect into Durban. We connect into Cape Town. Now, um, Durban is, um, as I mentioned, is, is where the, you know, the cables are landing. And so it, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the traffic I showed you from, uh, from my house in Kenya, instead of, you know, it goes to Mombasa, first of all. And instead of taking Lion to get to Mauritius Telecom in, uh, mm -hmm. in, um, in, in, in Mauritius directly, um, it, it, it takes one of the subsea cables to get to South Africa. Instead of peering with Mauritius Telecom in Durban, yeah. where there's an opportunity to peer with them, it goes to Johannesburg, and, and Mauritius Telecom are peering deep inside South Africa in Johannesburg. Um, I don't know if yeah. they're present. Um, I don't know if they're present in uh, Cape Town. Some of the ISPs, I know Rogers Capital. I think they're in Cape Town and um, and um, and maybe Durban as well. You know, so mm -hmm. um, it's, it's down to the different individual networks as to where they, yeah. they peer. So our approach is to is to interconnect and peer at every single internet exchange point where we possibly can, and we connect to as many different operators as we possibly can. So Mauritius Telecom, if they were to use some of their line capacity to connect into the internet exchange in Mombasa and peer there, um, and, and the one in Durban and Johannesburg, that would immediately reduce some of those latencies. And, and um, you know, these are some of the conversations we were having at, the, at, the, at that conference we had last year uh, in, um, in, in Mauritius. Um, mm -hmm. and uh, you know the operators need to start start using these facilities because if you uh, use the subsea cable and prefer one route over the other um, yep. you, you don't get the benefits uh, so you need to kind of use every option that's available okay all right so I see in the end or oh, right now um Cables are there, infrastructure is there, the, ex the exchange points are there. So it seems right now it's about that um, business partners and owners sit at the table and come to the agreements to, to activate those nodes so that the routes um, are actually going into a more preferable way um, for us in Mauritius. Um, with that, um, Ben, thank you so much for, for your talk, for your presentation. I really enjoyed the, the physical parts, the, the map with the different routes. It was very informative for me. Uh, being active in, in cloud development, uh, and, and I'm also really looking forward to have um, with your um, input, with your, with your activities, that Mauritius gets um, better exchange points and, 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 and uh, um, reduced latencies and 
um, shorter uh, routes uh, in regards to, to internet access. Thank you so much. Thank and, you very um, much. Looking forward then hopefully for the next conference here, the next developers conference in, in 21 that we can welcome you. Or if you're going forward with your own event again, actually uh, this year, uh, last year I was, I was a present as a speaker for you guys and um, would be great then to meet and, and uh, maybe exchange a little bit further on that part. Thank you so thank much. You. Have a great day. And um, thank you. Bye. All right.